Homer Guy's map and the road to successful car purchase. Hi, I'm Kevin Hunter, the Homer Guy. Author of Is That the Best You Can Do? Here today with the amazing Elizabeth. <laughs> Budget and vehicle selection. Before you do anything, you need to decide if you'll pay cash, if you'll finance, or if you'll lease. Knowing your car budget is easy when paying cash, just don't forget about tax title and registration fees. We recommend that car buyers go the cash route, but if you can't do that today and financing is your only option, there's no doubt that making good car buying decisions right now and not getting yourself in too deep, well, buying what you can actually afford and choosing the shortest loan terms, all of those actions right now will help you become a cash buyer much faster. With financing and leasing, start your budget process with how much you can pay per month. This is not a step you should be making while sitting at the dealership. That's way too late. I'm talking about while you're still at home. Before you even start car shopping, knowing how much you can afford per month will help you determine a car price to stay under. Be sure to also consider all the costs of ownership, fuel costs, insurance premiums, which are often overlooked, annual registration fees, maintenance and repairs, and resale value or depreciation, which is why smart car buyers often buy vehicles that are two years old or older. Put the total of all those costs into a spreadsheet and figure out what you can afford on a 36 to 48 month loan. This gives you a car price to shoot for and price, not payment, will become your determining factor. A big caution here and a real big caution. When you go to the dealership later on, don't let your monthly payment planning become the focus when negotiating price. When you become identified as a payment shopper by a car dealership, you're like a fish out of water, and you're in big trouble. Loan payment and term. It used to be that everyone recommended something known as 20-4-10. Make a 20% down payment, take a four-year loan, spend no more than 10% of your budget on all vehicle expenses, including maintenance and insurance. How many of you are doing that? With 0% interest financing, car buyers often forget about the down payment. They don't think much about the loan term which is why many get sucked into a 72 or 84 month 0% loan. And then they ignore the cost of ownership, which includes expenses, maintenance, and insurance. Instead, car buyers who take the 0% financing deals commit one of the biggest errors in car buying, which is focusing on the monthly payment. Cash down is always a big deal. Don't skimp on the down payment just because you're getting 0%. Dealers will commonly give you the option to put nothing down at signing, but don't fall for that. We recommend you put 20% down or more or as close as you can get to that figure to offset depreciation. You might say you can't manage that much, but by saying so, you're telling us that you can't afford the car you're trying to buy. You might be thinking you can just get gap insurance or new car replacement insurance from your insurance company or the dealer, but that's the thinking of a fool. You get to pay for a $1,000 policy, adding even more expense to a car you can't afford, which is a lot like adding insult to injury. Elizabeth, let's discuss why having good credit is so important. First, if you need financing, you need to get an approval for a car loan, right? But that's just a baby step. Yeah, yes, it is. When you have good credit, the car costs you a lot less over the life of the loan. Right. And with less than good credit, you can end up paying for your car twice. And a lot of people do, 150% yep. or 200% of the value of the car. It's ridiculous. And high interest rates are another reason that a lot of people are upside down on their car loans when they try to trade it in. And too much of their payments every month is going into that interest. Exactly. When you select your vehicle, make a list of wants and needs. Wants are nice to haves, while needs are have to haves. There's a huge difference. The more flexible that you are on each thing you consider a want or need, the more likely it is that you'll find a vehicle that will fit into your budget. If you're deciding where to shop, consider looking at dealer reviews on Yelp. Even if they have just the car you want at the right price, the reputation the dealership might have for stealing from their customers might already be in plain view on review sites like Yelp. Warning, don't use Dealer Raider. It's a bought and paid for subscription site for dealers. 2.5 stars on Yelp are getting 4.8 stars on Dealer Raider. That happens routinely. Now that you have a budget, a price, and a potential dealer or two to visit, some of you may or may not be aware of the rapid depreciation of a car, so let's discuss that for a moment with our investment plans so it makes total sense. If you buy a brand new car, here's something you ought to know. 
In year one, on average, you lost 25% of your original investment value. It could be as much as 30% if you're a very lousy car shopper. Right. In year two, you're out another 18%. Year three is around a 14% loss. Year four, still another 14% loss. And year five, you only lost 12%. Such good news. Congratulations. You've now accumulated a total loss of 60% on average. Well, there's a hidden tip right here. Remember I said that learning opportunity? So let's point it out. Have any of you wondered why we suggest that you shop for cars around three to five years old? We also recommend that you shop for cars that are five to seven year old and expand your horizon to private party sellers. Yes, we said it. Dealers aren't really the best places to buy used cars. Oh, especially not now. <laughs> no, definitely not now. Now, the layout you see here on the screen, the years of steady losses, this is what your finance man keeps referring to as an investment. <laughs> We have never really been big fans of CPO programs because it gives the car buyer the impression that this is a better used car for them to buy. However, that's not really the case. If you really want to know why dealers push a CPO car, it's for two reasons. Number one, to boost profits, to make more money in the back end after you get in the finance office. They get you with the pre-sold extended warranty and then they nail you with a bunch of other products and services and fees. They heap it on at the moment you agree that a CPO is a good way to go. And number two, they want to get vehicles back into their service department that are not necessarily the vehicles that would fall under the umbrella of their franchise new brands. They are producing another revenue stream, the ongoing maintenance of your car. Bottom line, it's all about the profits, not yep. necessarily about putting you in a higher quality car. Research fair market prices. There's so much information about vehicles on the internet these days. It's hard finding reliable sources, but I'll share a few of my favorites, all of which are sites that are used and recommended by people currently working in the car business today. Car Gurus, great resource for used car prices. Type in the make, model, and your zip code, and you'll find listings of cars all around you. You can also find new car prices, certified pre-owned cars, and private party sellers. If you're wondering if a certified pre-owned is worth it, ask me in the comment section below. Also, don't rule out private party sellers. Lots of great cars out there for sale by owner, and they are cheaper. TrueCar is another great site. It's useful for shopping both new and used car prices in your area, and you can get an estimated value of your trade here too. TrueCar also publishes a lot of video they share on Facebook, so go like the page and follow the informative stuff they publish. Cars.com is also good. Up-to-date prices for used cars in your area, and you can list your own vehicle for sale on this site too. I'd highly recommend you consider selling your own car because you'll definitely get a better price selling private party than you'll ever get from a car dealer. Just be smart about it. Kelly Blue Book. Lots of great information on the book value of your car, current used car prices, reviews on the car you like, and even a look at repairs and maintenance history. This could be invaluable information. Dealers often argue what you find at Kelly, but it's only because like NADA, Kelly publishes two versions of their own book values, one for dealers, one for customers. They likely do this because if they gave you the actual numbers a dealer will offer for your trade, you'd probably sell your car private party. Well, there's a little bonus hint for you. You should probably sell your car yourself. So the question is, regardless of what a dealer has a vehicle listed at, what should you pay for any used car on the market? Let's start with this. To have a clue what the right price to pay is, no matter who you're buying it from, and I'm talking about it could be your neighbor or your local dealer, you have to understand that every car on the road has a wholesale value. It's known in the business as ACV or actual cash value. If you don't know the ACV of the vehicle you're looking at, you have no idea what you should pay for it. You're guessing, no matter who you are. We've shown you in the past how to use Kelly Blue Book and other resources to determine the wholesale value. The video is on this channel. It instructs you how to look up the trade value, find good condition, and look at the price at the low end of that range. Well, that number plus 100 bucks, that's going to be in the ballpark of the wholesale value of the car. Eh, within a few hundred bucks. Today, I want to show you not only how good that video was, but an added brilliant shortcut to getting a cash offer on any vehicle sitting on the market. I've done it many times. Take down the VIN number, the year of the vehicle, its make, model, color, and the basic trim level information. You also need the miles. Let me show you how you can get a cash offer from multiple dealers on the car you're looking at right now on a dealer lot anywhere. 
Let's say I'm looking at this 2017 Toyota Tacoma sitting on a lot near Tacoma, Washington. It's a real truck sitting on South Tacoma Honda's lot right now. I'm going to Kelly Blue Book and click the button for my car's value. Next, you'll see Instant Cash Offer. Click the button for Get Offer and Trade In Value. Put in the basic details you collected from the vehicle, enter everything in. After putting in all the details, Kelly shows me what the trade values are. And just a few minutes later, I get a cash offer for the vehicle I'm looking at. A dealer is willing to pay $25,215 for the truck I'm looking at on another dealer's lot. What should I buy this truck for, dealer or private party seller? Well, from a dealer, I'd offer $27,000. From a private party seller, $26,500. Math is pretty simple. I took the cash offer of $25,215 and added a profit of $1,250 to it. For the dealer, I added an additional $500 to cover detailing, oil change, and other lot expenses commonly referred to as lot pack by dealers. I added 5% profit and just rounded the numbers up. On this trip, you're going to see how many details a mechanic covers that most of you would never know how to do or lack the tools to do, and that's why you're wasting big bucks on an extended warranty. Meet Ruben Byman, owner of Longview Auto and Tire. Take a picture of the dash with the car running so I get a picture of any warning lights on and the mileage. And we'll go out and drive it. So we're gonna go out and test drive this guy. Listen for wheel bearing noises, suspension rattles, creaks, groans, anything that might um, you might be able to hear or notice on a test drive. Great mechanics make a living driving and working on cars. It always makes sense for them to take it for a test drive and then go through all the functions in the vehicle. Ruben's going to take this opportunity to test all the windows, the air conditioning, the heat, the radio, the horn, everything inside the vehicle will get a functional test during this test drive. One of the things he'll do would be to accelerate hard to see how the vehicle shifts and then also to brake hard and check if there's any distortion or things going on with the brakes. Getting into an accident without coverage is a nightmare that you don't want to have. Here are a few tips on how to reduce your auto insurance premiums. Number one, get multiple quotes. And you can do it online within minutes. I just wanted to mention that getting quotes from multiple insurance companies just makes a lot of sense. For years, like even in my own household, we stuck with the same carrier. And maybe you're in that same situation now. However, I was very surprised by how much insurance premiums can vary at any given time the same policy for the same driver uh, from different carries can vary by as much as several hundred dollars a month. Number two here is consider the car you drive. Now I mentioned that the Honda CRV is one of the cheapest cars to drive. The type of car that you choose can have a significant effect on your insurance premiums. In one study on the least and most expensive cars to insure, annual rates ranged from $1,112 for a Honda Odyssey compared to $3,800 for a Mercedes S65 AMG convertible on the same exact driver. So the type of car makes a big difference. And types of cars, if you, you do searches on the cheapest cars to insure in your area, and here as an example is the Subaru Outback. Uh, one of the Jeeps was also high on the list. And then of course a Honda. Is there a best time to buy a car? The simple answer is yeah. yes. As in when you need one. Generally speaking, the later in the year, the better the deals get. First, end of the model year. The next year's models are coming to the lots. End of the calendar year, as in October and November, and December is even better. End of the month, the closer to the end of the month, the better. End of the car's design cycle. A redesign and new features are coming and they want the old stuff gone. End of the car's life cycle. The vehicle's done. Manufacturer pulled it from the lineup. If these cars are still on the lot, the dealer wants to be done with them. Some days of the week that are better than others. Monday or early in the week, you get better service, more attention, and a sales staff that isn't too bogged down with others. Dealers like to see cars move on the early days in the week. Let's take a look at a few scenarios that could point to 0% financing simply not being a good deal at all. Let's take a look at a low-end vehicle. A $20,000 car with a 0% financing offer for 48 months could be paid off in four years. Without added products and fees, the monthly payment is $416.
At a local bank or credit union, you could easily get a car loan interest rate around the national average of 3.45%. Over four years, that would be a $447 monthly payment, just $29 a month more. However, here's where it gets interesting. By using a traditional car loan instead of 0% financing, you'll be able to use the new car rebates to your advantage, something you typically can't do with 0% financing. If this car has a $2,500 cashback rebate, the amount you're financing would drop to $17,500. Using the 3.45% interest rate from your credit union, your monthly payment would be $391 a month, $25 a month less per month, and the amount paid for the car over the life of the loan would be $18,760. Simple math shows you'd save more than $1,200 by taking the credit union loan with the 3.45% interest instead of 0% financing. Make sense? Bottom line, before you lock yourself into 0% financing at the dealership, Compare car loan offers from banks and private lenders to see if they offer terms that, when combined with rebates, are better suited to you. If you do the math just as we did, you might find that 0% financing isn't a great deal after all. Once you've done a little homework, write down five good questions you'd like to ask. Try calling the dealers you chose. The good ones don't give you the runaround. They don't try to control you or steer you off your interests to their own interests. They don't force you into getting pre-approved with their finance office first, and they answer your questions honestly. Rate their responses, then schedule a visit to the dealer you feel best about, and that brings us to number five. Set up an appointment. There is so much wasted time in the car shopping process. When you're ready to visit a dealer and drive the car you want, you should contact either the internet manager or a BDC representative. Let them know you're ready to come in and you're looking for a member of the sales staff who knows how to listen and properly assist an informed car buyer. Have them verify that the car you want is there. Set an appointment to meet the salesperson they recommend and ask for his or her contact info. Call this person and confirm you made an appointment. Ask them what they know about the car you're looking at. Tell them you set aside two hours for them, which is more than enough time when someone has their act together and is not playing games. Number six, have the right documents. Make sure you have your driver's license, proof of insurance, and consider that you might need things like bank statements, pay stubs, etc. to prove income. If you're trading in your old vehicle, have your trade title and a lien release if it's paid off. If you still owe money on it, get the 10-day payoff amount before you visit your dealer and have it with you. Do all of this and you're prepared to get the deal done if everything lines up. Don't give out your actual permanent contact information. I'm talking about your phone number and email. If you do, you'll be setting yourself up for harassment calls and emails. It's easy to get around this. You can either get a Google Voice number or a temporary number through any of the services that are out there, and you can create a new email to use for your car shopping experience. It will be a great place to collect your information without unnecessary harassment in your everyday life. This is also pretty cool because when you decide to buy again a few years from now down the road, all of your previous homework is all there for you to look at, helping you to repeat good decisions and avoid repeating mistakes you made. The other thing to be aware of is that some dealers have been compromised in terms of security. Do you want unknown people getting your permanent contact information? I don't think so. Let's move on to the first meeting with a customer, otherwise known as the meet and greet. Not everyone is aware of the fact that a car salesman is trained to get contact information from every person they are talking to and enter them into a database. The salesman also has to check in with the manager's desk during your visit, which is an undisclosed introduction to a team of closers. This TO or turnover increases the odds of closing you on a car deal today. They want to know about closing questions the salesman is supposed to be asking and what your hot buttons are. Don't forget about the hot buttons. These are the things that distract you and make you think about other things instead of price, fees, big fat payments, and long loan terms that wipe you out. <laughs> Sales training emphasizes the need to create and sustain interest. Whatever you say is important to you, watch it get attached to everything. I've had a salesman tell me so many times what was important to me when I was on a car lot that I finally had to stop him and say, listen, buddy, you have no idea what's really important to me. That was really clear that he didn't. <laughs> he was a little surprised and looked a bit shocked. He didn't like me killing his buzz right in the middle of building momentum. Bottom line, they're trained to keep you focused on how all of your wants and needs are being met at this very moment by 
this car, and this salesman. Don't say you're open to any number of options, like color, trim levels, or vehicle type. If you don't already have a color, pick one and stick with it, even if it's not really important to you. Salespeople are looking for hot buttons, so let them focus on a perceived hot button that won't motivate you to do something foolish and allows you to go home and think about the things they presented today. As you're getting up to go, you can say, well, it's too bad it isn't blue, and this gets you back home looking at the car deal without a salesman breathing down your neck. So let's get to the question about a pesky salesman who won't stop asking you, how are you going to pay? And you don't want to tell them that you're paying cash. This is actually one of your favorite questions. This is my favorite. It's like the mic drop. Yes. Um, okay. So you never mention you're paying cash until the very end. And if they pester me about how I plan to pay, I just have a simple response. I say, look, I never talk about payment options or financial history out in the open. I want to be in an office where it's private. And, but even before that, is the car the price that I'm willing to pay? So if it's not the price I'm willing to pay, I'm not buying a car. You don't need to know my financial information. So there's no reason for you to talk payment considerations no. when you don't even know what the vehicle is yet that you're exactly. going to get. Yep. Okay. That's a solid point that any car buyer has to uh, remember. So imagine walking around in any kind of store, shopping for anything, and somebody walks up to you and says, how do you plan to pay? It's, <laughs> it's completely an unnatural question that only people, only those in the car business ask, and they're just doing it to try to set you up for the finance office. So let me ask you this. What if they don't take a hint and they keep bugging you about payment? What are you going to pay? I'll just say it again more firmly. I've already told you that if you don't have the vehicle I want at a price I'm willing to pay, talking about payment is pointless. And what if they keep asking, you know, through the conversation, it comes up again? Oh, well, I... I'm still respectful, but they can see I'm getting a little irritated um, because I've communicated clearly. And at this point, I say, your dealership is required by law to respect my rights to data privacy. So if you keep asking me financial questions out here on the showroom floor, that's not appropriate. And are, are you attempting to violate my data privacy rights? That pretty much kills it right there. <laughs> it's kind of like a, like a lawyer question. <laughs> There's a bad trend going on in the car business with trade-ins. Currently around 44% of new car sales involve a trade with negative equity. That is mind-boggling, but it's something most people are completely unaware of because being upside down in your car doesn't necessarily cause problems while you own the car. However, when it comes to trading it in, you put yourself at risk financially. If you're getting a 0% financing deal, many car buyers are likely to just roll that negative equity into the new loan. And you should know what that means. You're upside down immediately in the new car. And you'll be upside down for a long time to come. Sorry to offend some of you, but that's just stupid. Paying the previous loan off may not be what you want to do, but you'll be in a much better position if you pay off the remainder of the previous loan. Seriously, don't pretend you're the government who can just keep pushing a bad debt down the road. It never gets better. If you're trading, have you considered just selling your current car private party? It will net you the most money and help you cancel most or all of that negative equity I just mentioned. If you're still going to exercise poor judgment and trade in a car with negative equity, well, look it up in the KBB book values of your trade. Most cars are in good condition, not great or excellent. Use the Homer Guy formula to get the target trade-in value to negotiate for low trade value, good condition plus $100. Some of you would do better or worse, but if you negotiate your trade as an entirely separate transaction from the new car, well, wait them out just like you did on the price of the new car, and you'll have a much better chance of getting top dollar on your trade. Here's something you're not likely to hear from a car dealer. Even if you are getting a 0% offer from an automaker, you can and should negotiate the price of the car. Of course, you'll have to invest some time haggling back and forth, but the money you save will make it worthwhile in the long run. But it's still worth it. Even if it takes two hours to negotiate the price down to $2,000, don't let that frustrate you. After all, when was the last time you made $1,000 an hour? Before you ever go to the dealer, as in all cases, you should have done your homework on how much you should pay for the vehicle. We've done a video on this channel titled, how much do dealers pay for new cars to help you nail down their costs? So I won't get lost in the weeds on that now. Just go check out the video. Oftentimes, dealers will inflate the price of a vehicle to make up for the lost income on 0% interest. It's also more likely that incentives and rebates will be forfeited 
in order for you to accept 0% financing. This can make it more difficult to negotiate a lower price, but a reputable dealer will allow you to negotiate the best possible deal before the 0%. Watch the bottom line and don't leave money on the table. So what's your goal in finance? First, just get, get the junk off the contract. I line it all out. I tell them to fix it. Then I ask for the tax, title, license fees to register the vehicle to me. And I want that information right away. And they can have it just in minutes. It's all right in their system. Right. Finance officers like to fudge on these, like the taxes and state fees, by estimating them. Have you had that experience? Oh, all the time. What I'll do is if I have a vehicle I'm looking at, um, specifically I'll call the DMV office before I visit the dealership. I know exactly what the state fees are within, you know, a few dollars. And now I want the finance officer to give me that exact information. I don't accept estimates. And it's it's easy to tell the difference because an actual, you know, fee from the state has dollars and cents. After oh, dollars it. and cents every time. Yep. And I look them right in the eye and say, this is my out the door price, right? They, they love it when a customer say out the door, don't they? Right. When you know the lingo. <laughs> Three rules about car negotiations. Number one. Never say you plan to pay cash for your car until after you negotiated every aspect of your car deal. To get the best price in the car you want, you must let the dealer think that you might finance. You can get more details on this from our video, Don't Say I'm Paying Cash at Car Dealerships. Number two, don't ask for any of the fees that we're going to talk about to be removed from your car deal until just before you're ready to sign the contract. If you're at a dealership, you have to be sitting in finance when you do this. Don't worry. We're going to show you with a role play exactly how to do that. Number three, the only legitimate fees that you must pay on a car purchase are state taxes, title, and license fees. That's it. Any other fee the dealer claims they need to collect is just a profit line booster for their bottom line, and it is a fake fee. All right, every single day, new copies of car contracts arrive in our inbox, all asking for help on how to figure out what they're signing up for. One of the things you're going to notice on these car contracts is that they're all different. Different formats, different wording, everything different. For everyone who thought there was something uniform about what car dealers do, the answer is nope, not really. There are somewhere in the ballpark of 140,000 business entities which sell new or used cars and every one of them seems to have invented their own paperwork. Perhaps this is why car buyers are so easily confused. Today, I hope to clear up some of the confusion by walking you through several different contract layouts and telling you what I would be pulling out of each car deal. Let's roll. All right, this first car contract is a 2018 Audi. Down here, documentation fee, $799. That needs to be fixed. A tag registration fee says estimate, $549. I never like to see estimate in this particular category because I want them to give me the exact number. There's been plenty of times where the estimate is actually double what the actual tag and registration fees are. So make sure you check that out. And then right up here above, true car market average, just disregard that. There's a long story behind true car, but don't put a ton of value into what they give you numbers wise. So on this particular car contract, $799 minus $75, because that's what I would make the dock fee, $724 saved. This vehicle is a 2020 Hyundai Santa Fe. A lot of stuff going on here. $499 for a window tint. I'm not a big fan of this to begin with, but you might like to pay this $499, so I'm going to skip that for now. Documentary fee, $499. Again, it's too high. The tire battery fee, $5. A lot of dealers would do this nickel and dime fee type stuff. There's postage down here, $4 as well. You know, what I would say to this dealer is, I spent $10 in gas coming here, so I have a gas fee that I'm charging you for being here. And, you know, just all these ridiculous things that they put in there. Anyhow, documentary fee, $4.99, needs to be adjusted to $75. $424 saved, and you can elect to do what you want with these other nickel and dime fees they're adding in here. This is a car contract for a 2020 Toyota Tacoma. If you look here, there's gap insurance for $1,050. I wouldn't buy that. Documentary fee of $150, I'd adjust that to $75. So a total of $1,125 saved. I want to point something out. It says cash down payment, $0. Come on, you guys. And then up here where it says the payment terms, 60 months, 72, 84 months. This is a dealer that is pushing long-term financing on their customer. I want to start seeing some 36 and 48 month terms here instead of these car mortgages. This is a 2016 Mazda CX-5. 
you have a 799 CPO, I would pass on that. Then there's a estimated taxable fees of $132.95. I'd take those out as well. And a documentary fee of $999. I would adjust that to $924 and only pay $75 for that doc fee. $1,855.95 saved on this one. And again, I want to point out they're pushing 60, 72, and 75 month loan terms. Come on, you guys, get your act together. Let's start seeing some 36 and 48s on these. Here's a 2017 Volkswagen Golf down in the taxable fees estimated, $28.50, and then a dock fee of $6.99. I would correct that to $75. $652.50 saved on this one. I want to point something out here, and I give major kudos to this car buyer. The vehicle they're trading in, see the $17,361.75? Well, the trade payoff is $8,500. Here's a guy with nearly $10,000 of positive trade equity in the vehicle that he's trading in. He did a proper deal on the vehicle before. That's how you get it done, you guys. Here we've got a 2016 Ford F-150. Dealer fee, $795. That's the same thing as a dock fee. They just left dock out of the title there. Electronic filing fee. This is just another fancy name for another dealer dock fee of $167.50. Then the license fee. Whenever you see a rounded number like this, $400, it's very rare that the actual state charged fees will be an even number. So always ask them to do the homework and get the exact number. As I mentioned before, sometimes this number could be $215. Well, I don't want to see a round number there. I want to see the exact number. I'm not giving them more money than they deserve. And then there's this Nitro, $49.95. So the breakdown on this one, $7.95. I would take $75 out of that. $167.50 wouldn't pay that at all. $49.95 wouldn't pay that either. $937.45 saved on this contract. Here's a 2020 Toyota Tacoma. Look over here to the right. They've got permaplate. This is uh, generally a paint coating. $3.95. I wouldn't have put that on the car. Taxable fees estimated. $107.50. I'm not paying that. $8.99. A dealer dock fee. Again here. Outrageous dealer dock fee. I'd only pay $75 for that. And then again, non-tax fees, $400. Not likely that it's rounded. So I would make them get the exact numbers. So I'm not paying more than I need to for our lovely government fees. So here we got the totals. $3.95, $107.50, I'd give them the $75. So there's $1,326.50 saved. I also give them a little extra credit here for actually showing terms of 48 months on this car deal. So kudos to the dealer on this one. Here's a 2016 BMW. There's actually not much extra in this one, but dealer business license tax, knock it off, you guys. $138.85. I wouldn't pay the dealer's business license tax. <laughs> what a joke. $579 in processing fee. I'd reduce that to 75 bucks. So on this one, $642.85 is what I would save. I apologize for the fuzzy copy on this one. Not sure what vehicle type this is, but this is the way some of the contract reviews come into us. Age property tax, $150. Yeah, I'm not paying your property tax, Mr. Uh, dealership. Then there's $399 for the dealer documentary service fee, it says. There's a filing fee of $66 and emission fee of $75. Yep, yeah, not paying any of those. I'll give them $75 for a document fee. $615 saved. Now let me point out something down here at the bottom. There's a $200 cash down payment. Let me explain something to you guys. You're not buying a refrigerator. So $200 uh, cash down payment here. Come on, don't turn this into a joke. Pull a couple thousand dollars out of your pocket. Now we're talking. Here we have a 2020 Infinity, a tire disposal fee of $12.50. Not going to pay that. $7.75 for a dealer dock fee. Again, should only be $75. So on this particular contract, $712.50 saved. Here's a 2020 Hyundai Palisade. They've got $325 for a dealer handling fee. I would reduce that to 75 bucks, so $250 saved. I also want to point out here, the payoff on the trade that they turned in, zero. So check that out, $8,200 they got for the trade and nothing owed on it. Smart car buyer right here. 
We cropped enough out of this one that you don't see the vehicle type here, but here's a documentary service fee of $169.27. They're trying to be cute here with this 27 cents. That's hilarious. Optional ERT fee. Yeah, I don't ever pay any optional fees. Uh, so no thanks on that 25 bucks there. And then gap coverage down below $680. Believe it or not, that's actually starting to look like a cheap gap policy compared to what some dealers charge. But I wouldn't be interested in the gap either. I'd give them $75 for a dock fee and $799.27 saved on this one. $1,500 is the cash down payment this customer is paying on here. And I want you to notice that the total was fourteen, almost $15,000. So this is 10% down. Um, double that number, $3,000. And now we're talking. Here's a 2019 Dodge Ram. Down here in the bottom, dealer handling fee, $599. No thanks, I'll give you 75 bucks for that, $524 saved. And again, they're quoting TrueCar. Don't put a lot of stock in that data that's up there. You'll see a presentation coming up here soon on this channel on TrueCar, and you'll understand why I don't put a lot of stock in their numbers. This is a 2017 Volvo. And as I remember from this particular customer, he decided not to do this car deal after all. But here we have $1,247 in aftermarkets. In most cases, I pass on all of those things. So this is money I'd take out, a dealer dock fee of $499. Again, I'd reduce that to $75. Bucks. And so on this particular one, $1247, $499, give them $75 for the dock fee, $1,671 saved. I want to give this person here major credit, total cash down payment, $9,000. There you go. That's getting it done. These last two contracts, this one being the worst of the entire bunch and the next one being the best. So you can see what that looks like going from worst to first. Here we have $1,120 for dealer options. If there's any way to get rid of these, I'd do it. A dealer processing fee, $799. Then there is an extended service contract, $1,163.90. No thanks. A maintenance contract with tax, $1,905.50. Again, no thanks. Gap insurance. 395 that's actually a pretty low cost gap insurance policy there then they have purchasers online systems filing fee twelve dollars and sixty cents now they're just trying to nickel and dime you then a dealer's business license tax 3124 i'm not paying your taxes dealer you cover your own taxes so here we go eleven hundred twenty dollars 799 eleven sixty three ninety nineteen oh five fifty three ninety five twelve sixty thirty one twenty four i'd give them seventy five dollars for the dock fee and save myself $5,352.24 on this car deal. And here's the last one I'm going to share with you today. This particular car contract, awesome. Accessories, service contract, gap, all those are zero, zero, zeros. You don't see any other major fees on here. The only thing I have circled is the title inspection and dock fee category. They've kind of sandwiched a bunch of things together. You don't really know what the dock fee is. Normally I pay $75 and that's it. So have them break this out. But all total, this is the cleanest contract I've seen in a long time. So whoever got this deal, you win the clean contract award. Congratulations. Carefully think through your reason for buying. You know, you've been dreaming of owning this car since you were a kid or maybe ever since you made your last bad car buying decision. You think that this purchase will make you happy or impress your friends, but you're wrong. That's the wrong motive altogether to be buying a car with. You're not thinking through your buying decisions. You're thinking emotionally instead of logically about the car deal. I want it is not a logical reason to buy a car. Oh, man. <laughs> Consider the opportunity cost of your money. Every time you make a choice, there's a certain value you place on that choice. Whether you know it or not, the opportunity cost is what you gave up to get the car. That add-on or that extended warranty or any service or the so-called peace of mind the finance man is going to talk to you about. In this case, the opportunity cost of getting those things is the money you lost to get them. Think about the idea of opportunity cost. If I spend money on this, then I can't spend money on something else. Seriously, if you've never heard of Dave Ramsey show, watch a couple before you go car shopping again and you'll have a whole new respect for the money that's in your pocket and your ability to use your own brains. <laughs> All right, if you appreciate our video today, consider giving us that great big thumbs up. And please, always remember to comment on our videos.
comments really matter because they help boost the search algorithms, and then others find this content too. Add hashtag the homework guide to your comment. If you're on other platforms, look for us out there. There's a list of options appearing on the screen now, and they're linked in the description box below. If you're new here, make sure you check out all the other videos we have. We're now over 46 million views, and you might as well benefit from all that great content too. If you want to show your support with a tip, well, PayPal and Cash App links will be easy to find in that description box down below. The entire homework guide team is here to represent you the car buyer and that's exactly what we do well thanks everyone for coming back we'll see you on our next video you guys rock i'm kevin hunter the homework guy here with the amazing elizabeth we, we gotta, gotta go, go.